So, yes, welcome again to another uh, Friday Careers in Sport with um, with Colin and uh, now with added merchandise, as you can see. <laughs> so <laughs> today you can see up in the background there is uh, Andy Keese, so CEO of uh, London Irish Foundation. But really, that's where you are now. And, and I'm going to be honest, is that looking at you as, a, as the man and, and your journey through sport, there's so much there. Your CV must be look like nearly a, a roll of um, wallpaper long. So, Andy, first of all, tell us about your your journey and all the jobs you've got to to be where you are now with London Irish Foundation. Tell us about your journey. Yeah, there's certainly a career path uh, changing. I, I actually started off in the uh, Metropolitan Police as, uh, as a young 18-year-old and and in 1993, I got an opportunity to do a bit of coaching in South Africa. Um, to make it very brief, I ended up going on a two-year contract to coach Natal, which was a super rugby province. Um, in 94, I uh, took a career break from the police and um, didn't actually go back. So after that, I went into professional sport until, well, really, um, 2007. So when you... When I was in the toll, first of all, you were still uh, working in the police then, yeah? Well, obviously took a career break to go, yeah. Yeah. Um, because the game was still amateur back in those days. It was on the brink um, of being coming professional. Uh, yeah. And it was one of those aspects where you you decided to test your test the water, really, to see if it was good for you and if, if the game, if it was right the other way around. And it obviously was good for you because you got yeah. where you are. Had some good times, yeah. Good times. So you were, so you went to Natal. So what, was that like your first management job or coaching role with, in rugby? No, pro, pro, well, semi-professionally. I should be careful on that one um, because um, no, it was in the amateur days. Um, I was working at Harlequins uh, along with Dick Best, the who was the England coach from 1990, 91, um, and then 93. Um, as I said, I went to or ended up 94. Uh, went to Natal to coach Natal um, and be the coaching director, which was, as I said earlier, was really sort of going to all the outreaches um, in South Africa around uh, KwaZulu Natal. Cool. Tell us because you told you've told me the story before we started this. So tell me about that story. What was it like going out to those outreaches in in South Africa? Well, it was really strange, really, because you're in the cities around Durban, um, and that's pretty much like parts of uh, the UK, but then you go into the big rural areas and, you know, sometimes because of the time aspect, we had to get a, a, a small little four-seater plane uh, chewed up the coast to places like Dundee and Newcastle. Um, and you do do coaching in rural areas and you, as you arrive, you'd have a field with about 700 kids uh, on the field and uh, away you go. Wow, that must have been some sight to see, yeah. Must have been some sight to see. Yeah, it was. You know, a lot of them, they were short in um, kit. They didn't have kit, um, didn't have shoes, boots, obviously. And um, But it was their love of being involved in the game. And more importantly, the people was just so friendly. Whenever you arrived, they looked after you, you know, and uh, they were they were like sponges. They just, they just, the game was so important to them and still is. Yeah, they take on everything. They took everything. Oh, marvellous. So then you came back from, from South Africa. Then where did you, where did you go after there? Yeah, then the game turned professional in '96, um, and I came back to Harlequins again. But now yeah. we were now the game was going professional, which uh, was yeah really good. Mark, oh, brilliant. So at the moment you're with Underla uh, London Irish Foundation. So tell me about your job there. What's your job like there, and what do you do? So it's a, a normal working day. Wow, wow, uh, never the same really. Um, I think the. What happened is after I retired um, as a professional coach, I, I ended up going back to South Africa, um, working for a charity called Soul of Africa, along with my wife. Um, and that was to do with AIDS orphans. And cut long story short, we, we went there to help the charity out for two years and ended up living there eight. But when I came back because of our obviously family, etc., cetera, um, in 2015, I went to, uh, to London Irish and worked as a head of community and that was the introduction really into the foundation the mm -hmm. club wanted to have their own charitable arm uh, the london irish foundation and a year ago is um when it happened so where what do you do on a daily basis i, I think the 
the way I like to describe it is the rugby club is 125 years old. Um, and though we would have liked to have suggested that the rugby club was inclusive, it wasn't. It was only when you become a foundation and you get into different areas that you do become really inclusive. And, and that's the nice thing about the foundation. You, you, you focus on a lot of different areas from SEN schools to, to places of um, severe disability, to, to homeless, to prison work, to, to school. Um, we work on tackling health, which is about helping kids out with obesity. So the variation across the board is wide. So yeah. hence that's why each day is um, throws up diff different opportunities and different challenges. So that's that's what I like. I guess for myself, coming from from football clubs and football backgrounds, is that you have like exactly the same thing. These foundations, those these charitable foundations that work alongside a football club, especially in the Premier League, and when a when a student when people look at the football clubs or, or a rugby club they see the club they don't see these other you know, these other organizations that work alongside them that do so much good and as you say just out in the community helping the community and just making the community better so it's, it's a it's a good thing isn't it yeah it is <laughs> for for a long time as i said um you know we we've had for lots and lots of years that rugby clubs have been working in the community and it's more based on developing rugby um you know rugby clubs and schools but this takes it a lot further the foundation takes it a lot further a lot deeper and it gives it gives people in sort of disadvantaged areas the opportunity to have uh, projects given to them whereas before they weren't in a position to be able to do that because they yeah. could afford it and i guess you're background again going back to south africa and doing two years which turned into eight years of charitable work there with the aids foundation kind of runs alongside well, you as a person that's your, like you know part of your cv isn't it yeah I, I think it sort of that really came about because of uh my relationship with a guy called mike getty who unfortunately passed away um who sort of became a really strong friend of ours and the family um and he started it and as I say, it was driven by my wife and him, and um, I sort of helped where I could. And we and effectively, like I say, within a period, we we raised two million dollars. And wow. you know, some of the some of these kids, when you went to visit them, it was it was just it really made you wake up to life and gave you a different opinion. So, you know, that was a, that was a great time. We really enjoyed it, and we we certainly helped to make a difference. And I think that's what I I enjoy about the foundation is you know i've got some real quality people uh, in our team that do make a difference yeah excellent excellent so you've got loads of people helping out in your te in team and, and you're making a difference but for yourself personally like we've all got our heroes in sport that we look up to so for yourself is there is it that hero who's your hero in sport and who's that person you like you, you really look up to oh my word um, and it doesn't have to be in sport you can have anybody i mean you know, any, anybody that's, that's your hero, that's somebody you look at and go, do you know what, that's a decent, I mean, again, like I use it as like a role model for a lot of these up and coming, you know, these, these students, these, these people that we have, you know, in our foundations, in our, in our um, community sports trust and so forth, that we're working towards. Yeah, I suppose um, I mentioned him earlier, this guy called Mike Eddy, he probably uh, is a guy I really looked up to. Uh, he just had a, uh, you know, I don't think there was a day when the guy wasn't happy. Yeah, happy go lucky. Um, he had his own business, had his own shoe business. Um, he used to drive around the city, sort of. He'd go and get cash out of a, you know, coins out of the bank, um, and he'd stop off. And if there was someone at traffic lights who was begging, he wouldn't give him anything, but he'd encourage him to do something about it. But if it was someone trying to sell something at those same set of traffic lights, he'd give him cash. He wouldn't take anything from them because his attitudes. If you're trying to do well in life then I'll support you. And he, you know, he's a guy I've always looked up to and he gave to the local rugby club and, he, you know, is sort of, uh, if you cut him open, it was all about giving, you know? That's good. That's, uh, that's, that's, um, yeah, that's cool. Very, yeah, really good. So start off, well, you actually start off as a policeman. Yeah. Policeman, rugby co coach, now CEO. So that's quite a journey, isn't it? Is this is this where you thought? Where did you want to be when you when we started off when you left school, joined the police? What was your big goal? What was your aim? I always wanted to be a cowboy. That's the truth. I've, 
<laughs> yeah, all I wanted to be was a cowboy. Went from my whole life thinking that. So what was yours? Yeah, I, I only got into the police force, if I'm perfectly honest, uh, through sport. Um, it, you know, I was I played rugby, football and cricket at a pretty good level. Um, and I ended up joining the police cadets first in, in the Metropolitan Police because of the sport. Um, then I did 14 years in the police force, uh, playing a lot of sport. Um, and most of my friends are still based around that sport. Um, I did a bit of police work and, and it was sort of, and I think looking back on it, it was probably the best thing I did at 18 years of age. You know, you were on the streets of Earl's Court and Kensington. You were, you were yeah. dealing with totally different types of people at one end to the other. Um, and it made you grow up very, very quickly. And it's something I look back on uh, and I'm pleased, uh, pleased I did. Oh, brilliant. So and so in this did this where you thought you'd end up? Did you think you'd end up somewhere like you know, well, on a on a rainy hello <laughs> on a, on, a, on a, a rainy end of April talking to me on on Skype because the whole the whole country's on like a lockdown. Is this no as you say, you know, it, things happen uh, by chance as uh, if that guy I met on a cold wet night in um, Acton hadn't suggested have you ever thought about coaching in in South Africa yeah my career would never have gone that way uh so you just don't know you know you take it you know if you look back and I think uh, as as we say to my son and my daughters that you say you know sometimes it it takes you to work out what you don't want to do before you know what you do want to do 100 percent that and and also like you said if you hadn't had that conversation there's almost that element of luck involved as well sometimes in getting to these places isn't there and like being taken in those in, the, in these courses so we've all had hard moments in our careers to get to where we are today so for yourself was there really really i mean because like it's, i think what i want to try and get across to students is is those hard moments in life that you overcome and you move forward and you build on so for yourself was there a really hard moment in life that you had or in your career you've gone i've got over that and this time move forward and, and how did you move over it yeah, it's it's a good question. The the especially when you're involved in professional sport, I think um, I think it's a phrase that we always say to people. You know, you you don't really know what coaching is like a professional sport until you've been sacked. Um, and you know that there's never a truer word there that that you know you you can't go through professional sport or any top sport um, on a high all the time. The highs and lows, you know, you've got to fight through them. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you do it at the time? It's about having people around you, your support that you've got around you, um, and trying to look forward. And I think quickly thinking about your question, it's it's I don't like to look backwards very much. Um, and it's really about you can't control those things. So they're no. done, they're done. Um, you can control what you're gonna do tomorrow as a as an individual. So, you know, whatever happens, you you put yourself in a position that you can control tomorrow. That's one of those things. Actually, it reminds me of, of for myself is I, I try not to look back. I don't like looking back because I like to look forwards. It reminds me. I don't know because we're we're a bit older. So do you remember the film Gumball Rally with Burt Reynolds in? Yeah. So there's a scene in there. There's an, I mean, an Italian driver. He'd come over to America to, to race in the Gumball Rally, and he got in the car. And the first thing he did was rip off the wing, the um the mirror and throw it. And the American guy said, "Why are you doing that?" And he goes, "Well, what's behind you doesn't matter. It's what's in front that matters." And, yeah. and I, I've always remembered that from from being a kid, just like, oh, hang on, it doesn't matter what's back there. And I say it to my son, my son's just passed his driving test. I say to him, it's what's in front. That's the stuff you got to watch out for because behind you, they're watching out for you. So that's all you got to matter about. Decent. Yeah, I think I think the, the things about the things that are behind you are the things you learn from. And, you know, yeah, that they're the you know, as you say, with age that you remember that and you remember aspects of it. Um, and you and you take it on as a learning curve, but it's um, the negativity of of things that didn't go right, um, you know, and and sort of thinking too much about the positives doesn't take mm. you forward either. So it's yeah. about learning from both and then deciding how you're going to go forward. Hundred percent. So with SCL, we have like our our core values that we all work out. And for me, one of the big things are one of our core values is that putting the learner at the centre. So for yourself, working in sport, what, what sort of core values do you think are the most important things to, to succeed in sport and, and basically to succeed? 
Yeah, I think the the openness, uh, the discipline side of sport. You know, if if you're going to be involved in any team sport, then you've got to have a trust aspect. You've got to have a trust aspect with the coaches that you're involved with, with the, with the management. You've got to have a trust aspect with the players. The players have to trust the players they're on the field with. So you know, you have to create that discipline and trust to be able to be successful in pretty much whatever we're doing. Um, so yeah, I, I know. You know, SCL is working. I'm fortunate enough to know Stephen Lewis, you know, and um, and they, you know, they're they're typical positive people. So it doesn't surprise me that SCL has been successful because when you're led by positive people like that, they're always going to be on the right foot. 100%. And that's something that we often say about it is that is that whole, it filters down, that positivity does filter down and you, you can see it and you, you buy into that whole way of thinking. Definitely. Yeah. So for yourself, advice for, for young people, because obviously, you know, SEL, we're teaching and we're working alongside you. We're teaching in a, like a, a, a sports environment. So for young people wanting to get a career in sport or whatever that career may be, so some words from advice from somebody who has had a, a fantastic career in sport. I think, you know, you, you've got to have a dream. You know, it doesn't matter what point you're at. Uh, you've got to have a dream. You've got to decide what you want. And you know we've always said to all sportsmen and you know we say it to our son regularly it's 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 just not about talent talent's not enough um you've got to have the desire put yourself around people that will help you uh, drive that desire but um it doesn't matter what your background is if you work hard um along with that talent then you know you'll get you'll get your just rewards yeah just that's it that's it they're working hard and working hard and talent definitely the work hard comes with it so for the moment, this is like a, a, a bit of a, an outreach then for you. You can sit there at home. You can send out a bit of a, a message to all your learners currently on, on, on your program. Is there anything? What do you want to tell them? Well, I'm like, uh, yeah, the it's typical sit, sitting in a position like I sit. It's, you know, I'm only as good as the, the quality of people I've got around me. And that is the strength of our foundation is the quality of staff uh, that I've got around me. And, and they're the real, they're the success story for me because they go out there, they deliver, they they push the story. Um, I sort of drive the ideas with them, but but they're the, that, that, they're the part of the success that makes it work. Brilliant. Any, any top tips for those learners that you've got in your program for this this current sort of very unique period in time that we're, we're living through? Yeah, it's amazing how uh, I think everyone said it. It's the communication side, isn't it? When you when you're locked in, you know, even if even now we sort of when you're talking on um, on a Zoom call or, or a Teams call or Skype or or even if it's just a straightforward a telephone call, which I'm poor at. Um, do you not think though? Do you not think that telephone calls now are, are like when my tele when my phone rings, and I go, oh, hang on, and I forgot how to answer it because I'm so used to now all my communications being through this. Yeah, and I find it a lot better because I'm dreadful on the phone. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, and it, I think, but communication is key. You know, if you yeah. if you've got great family around you you know we're all we all have our ups and downs uh, in this period but it's talking it through and and it's not being afraid just to say yeah today's a bad day for me you know? yeah just take a day out fantastic all right well andy thank you so much for uh for spending some time with us on, on careers in sport for, for with scl it's been an absolute pleasure and a, and a real honor to speak to you because i know you've You've lived an amazing you know, period in time and done a lot of things. And it's, it's been great getting a little bit of an insight into that. So thank you very much. Um, this, this week's Careers in Sport and uh, we'll see who we've got next week. All right. Many thanks. And we always shake hands, like a virtual shake hands. So, so you've got to put your hand up. <laughs> yes. Feels good, doesn't it? I've, I've missed that bit. And I'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you.